Good evening. This is Mae Brussel. The title of this broadcast is World Watchers. It's tape number or broadcast number 712, July the 29th, 1985. World Watchers is played in the Bay Area from... Uh, it comes down here by way of Cupertino, KKUP, but it's also played on KFJC. On those two stations, twice a week, David Emery puts those on and has for the past years. And in addition, he has his own broadcast, One Step Beyond, with Nip Tuck. That's three hours a week. And then they have a marvelous series called Radio Free America. And I'm going to begin talking about that next week and telling you where you can get tapes of these particular broadcasts and what Radio Free America is. Now, the listening audience of World Watchers up in the northern part of California, not too far from here, carries to Berkeley and uh, to the San Francisco area. And people who are interested in these kinds of subjects that we talk about also play the uh, radio to KPFA Pacifica. And there's quite a difference between the kind of material we carry and the attitudes of the people at the two radio stations. Uh, David Emery and Nip Tuck get calls frequently about the difference of the material and uh, why they're not carrying the information we are carrying. But Nip and David are not as familiar with Pacifica as I am because I've been on the air 14 years. And uh, WBA in New York, a Pacifica station, carried World Watchers for three years. And then Bob Fass was fired and May was taken off the air. A political gesture, and I will go into at great length, in three or four weeks, the Pacifica Radio, how it was formed, what's behind the conflicts, and uh, do an analysis just as I would of Mark Lane or Simon Wiesenthal and explain Pacifica Radio. They're Los Angeles KPFK, Bay Area KPFA, WBA on New York. I don't have any contact or relationship with the Houston stations or Washington, that, but that's because these three don't allow May Brussel on Pacifica. And so to answer your questions about it and give you a little information of my experiences with people like Larry Bensky or referring to the call that Sarah Diamond made last week or two weeks ago up to KFJC, I will address myself to what I think is going on there based upon 20 years of research and also experience directly with that station. And also uh, they're getting a lot of calls on the talk show about Fritz Kramer. It is a very confusing subject I've been talking about on the air for three years. I will continue to do that and maybe do just one whole hour on the importance of Fritz Kramer. I think he is the most important man in the United States today or in the world. And keep in mind his offices he shares with Daniel Graham, a former general of the Defense Intelligence Agency, who is pushing the high frontier, the Star Wars, the next place to arm and make war from. And uh, Kramer is the mentor of Alexander Haig and Henry Kissinger. And every event in the news can be directly related back to this team and the people they work with, affecting the tragedy of world fascism as it's galloping along now. It was kind of just taking off the ground slowly, and now you read the world events and you know what's happening. So I'll talk more about Fritz Kramer and Pacifica Radio very soon, but there's so much important news. Not that that isn't important. But uh, I'll get back to that at great length. Uh, one or two or three weeks from now, I'm not sure. But I will cover that. And keep your curiosity up and listen to Pacifica and listen to KFJC and KKUP. Turn on Pacifica News. Make a list of the news. Monitor it like AIM is doing, you know, of the news media. The conservatives monitor, monitor radio stations and people and have a good thing going. They're going to monitor college classrooms now. So why don't you people who don't like fascism and don't like what's happening monitor the two stations and see the difference in the news, and then it won't take you long to figure out what's going on. Now, on to some very, very important stories. Number one on Joseph Mengele. I mentioned a few weeks ago that Romeo Tuma went to Germany with several teeth and some bones and a couple of hairs from a man that he was 99 and 9 tenths per sure, sure at the time, June 22nd, was Joseph Mengele. He's the chief investigator for San Paulo, Brazil, 21 years with the uh, police, the death squads, the terror intelligence operations down in San Paulo that work with our CIA and Defense Department. So he took these bones, to a few of them, to Germany and said that his investigation that ended June 22nd was, in quotes, a preliminary. 
Now, just this past week, the Houston Post, uh, well, several weeks ago, July the 10th, 1985, has a small item that West German experts are examining the remains of a body ruled to be Nazi criminal Joseph Mengele, but they don't expect their investigation to be concluded before early September. That's according to Hans Eberhard Klein, the Frankfurt public prosecutor who told reporters that uh, he wouldn't know till September. Now, that's quite a different story, don't you think, than saying they knew for sure when two articles have been released that uh, they're putting it off now until September, yet the name of Mangley is referred to in the past tense, and the media has conveniently buried him. Oh, pardon me. Hit the mic there. Another article out of the Washington Times about this case, July 19th, 1985, is about Professor Ellis Curley, K-E-R-L-E-Y, from the University of Maryland. I mentioned him several weeks ago. I was suspicious of him because, according to uh, articles and interviews with him, before anyone even dreamed or knew that Joseph Mengele was dead, except for the CIA, who, according to Jack Anderson, was going to pull this as early as November 84. He said the CIA was going to say he was buried, but he isn't. Mr. Curley was months before, early in the year, the first of the year in 1985, comparing heads and skulls that turned out, in fact, to be the size and shape of Mangley, so that the Justice Department and the CIA were going to use him, and they shipped him to San Paulo, Brazil. Now, after his confirmation that that was absolutely Mangley, there's an article, Mangley team called in to move deaths. Uh, This is an article about the three people who went from the Justice Department of the United States to identify Mangley and said that was him. And one is Mr. Curley. One is Ali Z. Hameli, the chief medical examiner of Delaware, who went to Brazil and is now going to Philadelphia. And the other is Lowell L. Levine, a New York forensic dental expert, not having the teeth of Joseph Mangley at all. And it said that Levine was an expert in the crash of the DC airplane in Chicago in 1979, another air crash that I was very suspicious of. I won't detail it now, though. Why were these men sent to Philadelphia, these three men? According to the Washington Times, although authorities believe 11 people died when the MOVE uh, organization was bombed, the house was bombed, there may have been more. Now, trying to find how many in the house wouldn't be too difficult because there must be some surviving parents in the United States or cousins or brothers or sisters who would know uh, where members of their family were. And also survivors uh, are outside the house. There were several that got outside the house. But they brought this team, the Mangley team now, has moved to Philadelphia. And this is their specific assignment. It's to tell how many people died. This is the quote how many there were, where they died, and what they died from. Mr. Warren, the man who brought them there, said they are trying to reconstruct a war with several hundred participants. It's a tough job. Can you believe that, that the federal government is spending money to find out which rooms they were and what they died from when the bomb was made from DuPont and Delaware and sent up there and dropped on their heads. Now, this was a case of war against America, testing, dropping bombs on people, just as the SLA was a CIA operation and the SWAT team were inaugurated with what I call the barbecue at the dinner hour, where six were killed in the fire while everybody watched. That was an overt act of war against citizens in the United States and to escalate it one step further. And I haven't done much on the MOVE organization because of so many other pressing news events. This is shocking. Then the article goes on to say that Mr. Curley was sent after President Kennedy's assassination to determine if another body had been substituted for the president. He said he studied photographs and x-rays and concluded that was John Kennedy. There were some people who thought the president was off somewhere in a hospital, a vegetable. He identified 3,000 more veterans from the Korean War. So since 1950, Mr. Curley has worked for the United States government. He has worked in the Kennedy case, and I'm sure it wasn't just that matter. I know that at the time of the conspiracy conference in Boston in 1975, Dick Gregory arrived to give the wonderful speech and or idea that John Kennedy was still in the basement of Parkland Hospital. 
So Mr. Curley didn't have to examine x-rays, but he had some other part. And goodness knows what could happen to those x-rays when these people are working with the x-rays and pictures of the late John Kennedy. And the House Select Committee is going to open up the assassination investigation again, which is run by Dr. Biden from New York of the CIA. And this Dr. Levine comes from New York as the expert on the teeth. So now they've been sent in to the MOVE movement. Well, these three men can do a ballet to any case they want in the United States. It's like the psychiatrist, Dr. Marx, Dr. Irvin, Dr. Sweet from Boston, and Dr. Jolly West from California, all working as a team. And every tragedy we have, one or three of these men come in. Now, the Jewish newspaper, The Heritage, had a quotation of Dr. Ellis R. Curley, Uh, A Jewish paper, of course, has to consider him an expert. I don't know why. This is July 5th. Mengele probably died in agony, scientist says. And it quotes from College Park, Maryland, that Dr. Curley said, in quotes, I don't know what court of justice would you mainly impose upon anyone a sentence that would be worse than the discomfort and bitterness that he complained of in his final years, including drowning over a period of several minutes. Now, Curley doesn't know a thing that was in Mengele's head, and he's assuring the Jews psychologically in the press release, I guess, to go to Jewish papers around the country, if you saw your child thrown in the fire and burned alive, if you saw these tortures at Auschwitz, if you're one of the twins that was experimented on, a victim of Mengele, Relax now because his suffering equaled your suffering because there's nothing worse than the bitterness he had and the way he died and nothing could equal this. It's equal to the courts of justice. I doubt that and I doubt that Mengele is dead and this man travels around and comforts those people that, in quotes, would want vengeance. Like, look, you can relax now. You suffered, he suffered. Get off our case. Now, unrelated to that and part of the Mengele story was a story in the New York Times, uh, July 24, 1985, about the murder of Ten Credo Neves Neves in Brazil. I want to share this with you. Brazilians debate the doctor's role in the death of Neves Neves. Rio de Janeiro, three months after the funeral of Brazil's president-elect Ten Credo Neves, his family renewed the debate over whether mistakes at two different medical teams contributed to the bacterial blood infection that killed him. There are rumors of mismanaged, poorly executed surgery, squabbles among the doctors, seven operations, 38 days in a hospital. He had two operations in Brasilia. Then he was moved into Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is where the Mangley body would be exhumed, where Romeo Tumo is that chief of the police down there, running uh, and reappointed by Mr. Sarney, the vice president who became the president when Neves was murdered. The new vice president, who was 20 years with a military dictatorship, ran as vice president, and then he reappointed Romeo Tumo and the, after the president had died. The article goes on, the president-elect's brother and his son said that uh, uh, Romeo, that pardon me, that Tancredo was a victim of incompetence and the vanity of the doctors. There are two long articles on the subject in the newspaper that say that he might have contracted a planned infection. This is in the papers in Brazil and that the infections were purposely overlooked. And it goes on to say that once uh, he was declared dead in Sao Paulo, the controversy seemed to be forgotten. Well, those of you know that May Brussel and World Watchers are probably the only broadcasting station, along with Dave and Amory and Nip Tuck up in the Bay Area, who have continued the idea that Mr. Neves was murdered. There was an article in London asking for an open examination, and another in Brazil saying he was shot. But for all purposes, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, what news media have you heard that have suggested the outrageous political implications and the murder of this gentleman? And the article goes on, the family's testimonies were given and later repeated before a news conference to throw new light on the confused event that began with his sudden hospitalization. You know, I call that the dinner with the archbishop. On the night of March 14th, hours before he was scheduled to take office 
as Brazil's first civilian president in 21 years. Now, around March 14th is when Mr. Roeder got a letter in the jail in Germany that uncle is dead, overlaying these dates and not wanting to jump around too much, Manfred Roeder. The article goes on, he said that just before surgery, the chief surgeon ran home to get his glasses and that Neves was taken to the wrong surgery room. They almost ripped off a finger, taking uh, his wedding ring off. The son said 40 people stood in the operating room, including politicians and relatives crowded in there, doctors, politicians, and relatives. There was a question whether they removed a diverticula or whether it was a malignant tumor. Six days later, new surgery was needed, and the rest is history. The family now says he was placed in a dressing gown and taken to a part of the hospital after the first or second surgery where photographs were taken, and he didn't want these pictures. They did it against his will. And he complained something ruptured in himself in here. A few hours later, it took a few hours after they had his portrait, I guess, done, he was found to be suffering from a internal bleeding and rushed to another hospital in San Paulo for more surgery. What a mess they made of me in Brasilia, he said. But after that, the rest is history, and he died. Now, part of the history going on in Brazil at this time is the debt of Brazil and the intermonetary fund that the newly elected president of Peru said, I won't go along with, I'm not going to starve my people. That was as of July 29th, just this morning. But there have been articles in the newspaper on the monetary problems of Brazil, and one story I have here is that Brazilian labor leaders were promised by Sarney, the new president, after uh, Neves died, that they would help from the onslaught of the intermonetary fund that is causing the austerity there. And Mr. Sarney, the vice president who took over after Neves was murdered, uh, called in Henry Kissinger to make sure that Brazil doesn't break their pledge to the intermonetary fund. Last week, the Brazilian press revealed that Finance Minister Francisco Dornay, D-O-R-N-E-L-L-E-S, had contracted the services of William Rogers, an executive of Arnold and Porter Law Firm, as well as Kissinger Associates, to give legal advice on Brazil's negotiations with Wall Street bankers. Now, Mr. Dornay, just prior to the President-elect's murder, was to prosecute a Mr. Garnero, I mentioned on past broadcast, and uh, he was the man who was going into the financial flight capital and the loans given to people like William Simon, a Knight of Malta, to George Schultz, and ties to the highest echelon of our government and the Vatican that have strangled Brazil's economy. So as soon as Sarney was in, he has called in the office of Ron Mr. Rogers, William D. Rogers, and also uh, Henry Kissinger Associates. Remember when Congressman Henry Gonzalez said that he asked in Congress in uh, about September 83, is Henry Kissinger a hired gun, and is the State Department leased to Henry Kissinger and asked for the clients? Now Sarney has given Brazil to Kissinger Associates. Then this article I have said that last year Venezuela signed a similar contract with Arnold and Porter and to raise their standard of living to the point of eroding such diseases as AIDS and uh, the flu, the malaria that is now sweeping these countries, Venezuela and uh, Brazil. The disease surfacing in Brazil can no longer be counted. They're taking away the uh, AIDS right now, but they're a frightening epidemic of deadly yellow fever. And you may have been reading about that, where 26 million in San Paulo are threatened with epidemic. Uh, the country now has absolutely nothing to eat. They export all of their food to pay for their economic debt to the International Monetary Fund. And uh, it's about 10 million tons of food are exported. So that the food is leaving Brazil. The people are starving, and they're even threatening diseases like AIDS or malaria. Like we can cure the diseases if you send us the money. Otherwise, you'll face these frightening diseases. Think of the implications. And Mr. Sarney now working and always has, of course, with Kissinger Associates. Now, just one quick second about the law firm of Arnold and Porter that has been uh, uh, sent to represent the Brazilian crisis and William Rogers. 
William Rogers of the State Department was part of the policy and planning for Latin America under Henry Kissinger. Now, you know what a success that was. The law firm of the uh, Arnold and Porter began in the 60s to facilitate domestic counterinsurgency and to begin Washington operations, and they combined the law offices of Paul Weiss, Simon Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison as of 1960. That is the date that I said Robert Mayhew was hired by the CIA to get John Rosselli and Sam Giacana involved in the murder that later took place against John Kennedy. We brought the mafia and the CIA and the FBI into those teams. And Simon Rifkin, who combines law firms with this particular uh, Mr. Rogers, is the man who set up the law office of TMI, or TCI rather, for Otto von Bolschwing, uh, later involved with Helene von Dahm, but the network of the Galen Operation Fascista in the United States under the wing of uh, Ronald Reagan and John Paul Getty and the people in the Bay Area that I've talked about in regards to the von Bolschwing scandal. I don't want to go into that too much. They also represent Great America Corporation, and that name ties in heavily to the Kennedy assassination. So the law office of Arnold and Porter, William D. Rogers of the State Department, and Henry Kissinger now literally own Brazil as of the murder of Tancredo Neves. And they will, it doesn't matter whether they bleed or disease, they want the money paid back for the loans they made when they knew they couldn't pay it back. I just wanted to make a few comments that are very, very important on the Aja case, Mehmet Ali Aja, that's taking place in Rome of vital importance, and then go on to part three of Simon Wiesenthal. Several articles I want to cite here. One is psychiatric testing done for Aja at trial in Rome. They've asked him to undergo psychiatric tests because he has been linking the CIA, Francisco Pazienza, that I talked about. He links to uh, Ronald Reagan and the GOP, of course, but he's getting awfully close to all to touching the bases and uh, throwing in the gray wolves, the Nazis. And Mr. Aja's trial, according to the New York Times, has been reversed and retracted with his testimony. The reversals created suspicion among uh, people at one time. They wanted to believe the Soviets and Bulgarians were be involved, but people have thought, well, that his testimony was right, enough to put a trial together. Now people think the Soviet Union was not involved in the affair. So at this time, when there are reversals in Aja's opinion, and uh, he said he was trying to get a political solution to the trial and bring in something that makes more sense to what is going on in Rome in the past four years, the uh, suggestion was made to give him a mental test. Now, he didn't have a mental test for four and a half years, and he worked with the chief mafia bosses in the jail cell, even visited with the Pope. Pope came to visit him, and with Francisco Pazienza, such an important man with the P2, the Masonic Lodge, and Lysio Jelly, and those connections. But now that he's falling apart, they've decided uh, to give him a mental test. In court last week, he said, I'm an angel become a man. I'm unique on the planet Earth, a great expert in mankind, a thousand times more so than Freud and Charles Darwin and others. And uh, he said, we on planet Earth have to get on with the trial. Well, the trial has been uh, put off. They're going to have a summer vacation. And I assure you that when the summer is over, his brains will be fried or his memory will become clearer because now they've suggested bringing in the Sykes to maybe reinforce some things and tell them what not to forget and what to remember. It'll be interesting to see what happens when the summer vacation comes. But in the meantime, one of the gentlemen, very important, that I'm going to spend hours uh, in the next few weeks of broadcasting about, uh, the uh, connecting link of, of Aja's uh, the assassination attempt on the Pope to the P2, the Masonic Lodge, the CIA. That is uh, Bekir Selenk, C-E-L-E-N-K. His first name is B-E-K-I-R. You've heard me mention him before in regards to this case. He was arrested in Turkey in July 13th. Turkey arrest defendant on the trial of the plot to kill the Pope. Authorities announced from Ankara, Turkey, July the 12th, that Selenk, who was being tried in absentia in Italy as a Soviet-sponsored accomplice, was arrested. He's a reputed mobster, and this is out of the Wall Street Journal. I'm reading this. 
Uh, and the charges against him were not specified, but seemed to be drug and uh, drug dealing and smuggling. So gun smuggling and drug dealing, or vice versa, whichever you want. So Selink was arrested in Turkey July 13th, and he is the important connection because he's wanted for two things. He's wanted for the Banco Ambrosiano for the P2 scandal, and he also is wanted for uh, the Ajan trial as a defendant in Ajan. Ajan connects him with the Bulgarians. Now, he was arrested July 13th, and Reuters had a wire service this week out of the Wall Street Journal again. A Turkish prosecutor today demanded the death penalty on smuggling charges for Bekir Selenk, who's also a defendant in the Rome Papal trial. He was indicted of smuggling arms and drugs in a case against him was formally opened in the law offices. Tur- Selenk returned to Turkey two weeks ago from Bulgaria. He had been virtually under house arrest. He fled Turkey after the 1980 coup. Now, the Turkish prosecutor, two weeks after they had him, want to kill him right away. And by killing Selenk, they break off the links to the Banco Ambrosiano, the P2, the Francesco, Pazianza case to uh, to Mr. Marcinkus in the Vatican, the head of the Vatican Bank, and to our Central Intelligence Agency. And then by killing him, they leave unsolved whether he was the Bulgarian in the Pope plot or whether he was a Nazi part of the Grey Wolf fascist gun running. So within two weeks, they want a death penalty, uh, not having murdered anybody in Turkey. Now, the public relations agency for the country of Turkey is Robert Keith Gray, close to William Casey in the CIA. I've talked about the powerhouse, and I'll be doing more of that later, and I've done it before, but our CIA literally is the agent for Turkey, as well as Haiti and Morocco and a lot of other countries. But Casey and the CIA are important in Turkey, as is Robert Keith Gray. So two weeks after he was picked up, they want to kill him in the summer interim, I suppose, so he can't continue uh, clearing his name in terms of uh, being a Soviet or Bulgarian. They, if they kill him, they can let it pass as that. Now, the Washington Post had a story July 20th, a Jean trial adjourned for the summer. That's another one on the mental tests of him. Oh, he says, pardon me, he says he's Jesus Christ. Now, Mr. Selenk in the Jean trial has been charged with paying the equivalent of $1.2 million for the assassination. And it's actually the attorney for Mr. Selenk, who's now in Turkey, Mr. Martelli, who's asking for the mental test. I think that uh, if I were working for the defense, I wouldn't ask for the mental test of Aja. I'd let the pro- burden of the prosecution be on that. That's a mistake. But Martelli asked for it, and the Washington Post says, as I said before, no physical examination was ever given by Aja, and uh, they never tested his mentality or the things he said, and Aja is now going to have mental tests in the summer interim. They've declared a recess. Aja said on the stand that before six or seven hundred journalists who came to Rome, that he wanted to make some political exploitation of the Soviet Union and Bulgaria. They took home with them the end of the world. The invisible God told me to announce that the world will be destroyed in this generation because of Bulgaria and the Soviet Union. So uh, he's going to have his little test, and Aja will have a recess, and goodness knows what will happen or if they will kill him in the meantime. Also, from the Houston Post, there's a story, Italian financier denies involvement in the attack uh, on the Pope. This is Francisco Pazienza who says he wasn't involved in killing the Pope, which can be absolutely true. He wasn't involved in the attack on the Pope. He was involved in telling Aja that he could have freedom if he said the Bulgarians did it. And so that he's in New York in jail saying, I didn't plan to kill the Pope, but that's a smokescreen. Think it out. Nobody said he planned to kill the Pope. He sat with Aja in prison and said, if you give us a Bulgarian Soviet KGB story, I will get you a passport passport from Muammar Gaddafi and you'll go out of France and you will be a free man. Now that is different than killing. In these assassinations, there are two elements. One is the murder of the person, the planning of the murder. The second is the cover up. 
and equally important for the murder is the cover-up and then to blame always either Russia or the loner and not to blame the Nazi fascist central intelligence defense intelligence that runs this country that has the technology to influence people to get these lone assassins either dead or to implicate the Soviet Union or to lose their memory and not know why they did what they did. I'll take a one minute break now. I did want to cover these very, very important stories that aren't separated. The P2 isn't separated from San Paulo, Brazil, and Romeo Tuma from Syria, and the drug traffic into San Paulo and into Brazil. But I'll start now. Simon Wiesenthal, part three, and I think that he's equally as important in understanding how these situations get out of hand. Good evening, this is Mae Brussel. The program is called World Watchers. It's the second part of World Watchers. It is broadcast number 712 and it's July the 29th, 1985. I'm going to do the second half of this program, this has half hour, on Simon Wiesenthal, his experience during the war and after the war as the alleged world's greatest Nazi hunter. He probably is that because nobody was looking for them, so you can give him the title. But the question is, how did they get so far and do so much, and what are they doing now? Now, every week, every day, I'm going through newspapers separating subjects, very important stories, recent coups that took place, murders, poisonings, perversion of justice, dictatorships that are coming back into power, CIA measures that Ronald Reagan took in the last two weeks. There's six or seven of them that are enough to strangle all of Central America and relate our intelligence operations worldwide now into those 162 embassies greater than we ever did before. Uh, but still, I have to go back to Simon Wiesenthal for this reason. I keep asking what happened to this country after 1960 or since 1960. What changed about it? You know that there's something that changed. We're not the same country. The youth isn't the same. The hopes aren't the same. The feeling isn't the same. The only difference is that some people can make more money easier than they did in 1960. The, only di the other difference is that it costs more to buy a home and get around, and you can lose it faster also. Something happened in this country, and I've tried to document this, what I call that fascism. Now, there are people who covered up the Kennedy assassination, such as Mark Lane, Bernard Fensterwald, Paul Hawk in the Bay Area, Harold Weisberg, Sylvia Marr, those people in particular, there's a click around them related to Fensterwald and his CIA activities, and they have suppressed the important information on the Nazi links to the Kennedy assassination. Simon Wiesenthal has suppressed the route of the Nazi war criminals and allowed them to do the work that they were doing, the chief organizers, in return for going for some of the other men who committed tortures or mass murders and played this role of silence. Now, by protecting those Nazis, these people have allowed uh, this country to be destroyed. I accuse them and would take them into any court of law and show them that this evidence was available, that they know where May Brussels is, that the documents are available. I answer every phone. I'm listed in the book, and I've made these charges and allegations, and that they have played a role. The reason I bring in Paul up in the Bay Area is that he is lined to uh, and close to Bernard Fensterwald back east, and he plays this uh, little thing in his newsletters that he gets out, little smears and attacks, uh, snide remarks on May Brussel and takes things out of context instead of sticking to the material or the essence of the research. Just as Larry Bensky at KPFA said when he was asked about May Brussel, he said, well, David Emery's okay, but May is hysterical. You notice that David Bensky, with all that radio time and all those years at Pacifica, has never once called the house, never come here, never seen the research, never taken these tapes and played back which part he terms hysterical, and how does that define this many hours of radio time, this much work, these many government documents that you can put together and make a pretty good prediction of the future based upon the past. I don't think I'm hysterical enough, and I think these people should be in the loony bin or carted off for lying to you that these conditions aren't serious and that they're going to get more serious. Now, last week, 
on World Watchers um, 7-Eleven, July 22nd, I talked about Manfred Roeder, a very important Nazi who's in jail in Germany and his relationship to the Aryan nations up in Idaho with uh, Richard Butler and his diary that revealed uh, the network of gun running and smuggling operations and terrorist network in Europe. Just this past week, and I don't have time to do it now, but I want to tell you what's going to come in the weeks, probably next week or the week after. I got an article on Manfred Roeder and his partner, Carl Heinz Hoffman, H-E-I-N-Z Hoffman. Hoffman is in jail with his wife in Germany, accused of the murder of a Jewish uh, newspaper man who compared him to Adolf Hitler, and he really is the new Fuhrer. Uh, Mr. Hoffman his background began, and I'll do more on that later, uh, as an art student, then in the Middle East and in Turkey. Then he came back and got a huge amount of funds to begin an operation identical to Robert Brown of Soldier of Fortune with John Singlau of the United States Defense Department behind uh, the Soldier of Fortune magazine that got off the ground with the mercenaries that are now working in Central America and around the world. Reagan has identified five countries where they are welcome to overthrow those countries. Now, the uh, article on Hoffman that I got from Europe says that he got his money from Gerhard Frey, F-R-E-Y. Now, if you read my Rebel article, page 34, written in November, uh, November 22nd, 1983, on the Kennedy assassination and the Nazi connections, there's a whole page on General Walker and Gerhard Frey and the Kennedy assassination. So what I'm trying to say here is, again, it's a year and a half since I wrote that article. And now Manfred Roeder and Karl Heinz Hoffmann, both in jail in Germany, link to General Walker, Lysio Jelly, P2, the Masonic Lodge, the Bologna bombings, the Terror Network, Roberta Calvi, Michael Sendona, the Republican Party with Michael Ledeen and Alexander Haig. Again, Haig is important in charge of NATO and the intelligence operations with these people and in the Kennedy assassination with members of the Bay of Pigs. So what has come together in the last week? I don't want to pass it off or go into detail now. I just want to tell you that Karl Heinz Hoffmann's connections to Gerhard Frey, the German publisher that General Walker called, when he said, uh, from Louisiana, and he called and said, this Oswald was the one who shot at me in April. This is a lot to swallow for people who are not used to this program or who have only heard a few weeks or don't remember the names. I'll be doing more on it, but more pieces of this puzzle, this fascist puzzle, are coming together. And that's why I accuse these people of never using a thread of the information to try to find out what happened. Now, last week, on uh, World Watchers, I talked about special favors that Simon Wiesenthal got and uh, during the war as a Jew in a work camp in Poland, and his wife was allowed to get freedom to go to another city or cities. She was protected and could escape, and he could work around with pistols. And while other Jews were being put on the railroad car to be exterminated, including his own mother uh, from the railway station, evidently where he was working, he continued to get high favors, and they're very important to show later and how soon he starts working for the United States government. So I'm going to continue with the chronology of Simon Wiesenthal, and the bulk of this is taken from his own book, The Murderers Among Us. I'm going, this is favor 13. I started numbering all the favors he had. He says that in September 1943, and this is, remember, Nazis go underground starting in March and May of 1943, and they're also beginning the mass extermination simultaneously of as many Jews as they can because they have not won the war against the Soviet Union. So starting in September 1943, all Jewish prisoners who lived at the repair works where he and his wife had worked before she walked off and where he was holding his guns, they were sent to a nearby concentration camp. And Simon Wiesenthal was in and out of 12 concentration camps. And Simon says he decided that it was time to escape because he was taken from the railroad yard and maybe he, he wouldn't survive if he went stayed in this camp. There would be no next time for him. So a friend of his at the camp, he had a lot of friends that saved him from two lineups of death squads so far. A friend of his named Mr. Kohlrautz allowed him to go to town to buy some drafting supplies, which would be the way for him to escape. And he was accompanied by Ukrainian 
policemen. I'll do more on the Ukrainian police. David Emery reminded me, and I know all these connecting links of the Nazis and the Ukrainians, but just say a Ukrainian policeman, no love for Jews at this time or any, believe me, accompanied him into town. And on October the 2nd, 1943, he got a pass. And Mr. Colretz knew what he was going to do. He let him leave, and he wrote passes for Wiesenthal and for another friend of her, his, a Mr. Scheiman, a former circus director. So Wiesenthal took out his two guns out of his desk at the work camp. This is while all these other masses of Jews are being deported and brought in from France and Holland and all the countries into the ovens. He gets out his guns, and the two men went into a stationary store and went out the back door, which was kind of cute. And then he went to the apartment of a friend where he stayed at his apartment. And another Polish friend from the repair works said he could hide in his parents' home. So he walks out a stationary store behind the guard, a Ukrainian guard, and he hid in closets at a home. And May the 13th, there was an alarm that the German, a German soldier was shot. So the SS men were going to conduct a search in every home. Well, from September to June, there's another lapse of time here. I mentioned one before, but from September, September 44 to June 44 is quite a long time for him to be hiding in Poland under the eyes of these people after he has, in quotes, escaped after a work camp and his wife was allowed to escape and wasn't punished. So the German soldiers were angry that one of their members had been shot. So the SS men, that's the Gestapo men, and I might remind you next week about what the SS are because of their close friendship with Wiesenthal. The SS men conducted a search, and they uh, had liquidated a concentration camp where everyone in there was killed because of the anger. This is the way they murdered after Heydrich uh, was killed, important man with the SS, Waffen SS, and a few Jews got away, just a few. The entire area where Wiesenthal would have been in that camp, he got a hunch to leave. They were all taken and killed, and he had eight days on the run with his circus friend. Now, the next favor, he survives this onslaught. The SS search, one thing he survived in the homes, and the other is the mass killings in the camp. The next favor on the run, he looks for, for some friends and moves to the apartment of friends, and there's some boards over some sand, and he stays underneath those boards where they protect him. And he has a diary. Now, this is the most important part of the Wiesenthal, one of the two most important parts about his story. He kept a diary of the SS guards and the crimes of the SS guards while he was in prison. He was allowed to keep a record of the names of the people and what they were doing. And there's, according to his story, several times the People in charge of him said, we better be nice to him because later we may have to count for what we're doing. So I ask a question, how can he keep a list while he's escaping out of a stationary store or hiding from them and all these people have been killed? How can he keep a list which he describes as certain death? Now, he was an architect before the war studying architecture. He was a painter at the railroad works. Where did he get his experience, and what was he going to do that he would risk his life keeping this diary? As I say, of May 44, the, uh, Kurt Reese has documented the Nazis go underground, underground. And on page 34 of his book, The Murders Among Us, it says, he believed that the list of SS guards and the crimes, of course, would be useful someday. Now, to believe they would be useful someday for future trials is different than having yourself thrown into an oven because you have a list. He's escaped these firing squads. He's escaped the camp deaths. How could he travel with a list of their names? He could have buried it in the ground somewhere, or he stayed at the houses of friend, homes of friends, not houses. He said the homes of friends, he could have left it with them if they were friends or buried in the ground underneath that hole where he stayed. But he took it with him. So the Chronicle goes on. The police went around looking for anyone who had escaped, escaped prisoners. And while he was at the home of the friend, they searched the house. And Wiesenthal was warned by these friends that they were going to come search it again. So he disappeared in the sand again. Now, the SS men came to the house, took away the boards, and two Polish men very kindly to Jews, of course, in Poland during this era. The detective seized Wiesenthal, and the SS man seized that diary. 
and he still had his pistols with him. So they took him to the police department at Smolky Square, S-M-O-L-K-I, and the Polish detective took away the pistols. If a German found a gun, he would have been shot at once. Wiesenthal was saved because the pole took away the gun. He was protecting him, so he's in prison. And keep in mind the whole history of this era, what was going on in that country that was so crazy. So the uh, detective there from Poland says, let me have your gun so nothing will happen. And then he wrote, if the SS read the diary, he knew he would be hung. Now, this time period, he said 149,000 of the Jews of Lvov, L-V-O-W, of those, only 39 had survived so far. And a Polish man in charge of it, the Waffen SS, Mr. Warzok, W-A-R-Z-O-K, threatened to kill the remaining 34 Jews in his hometown. Then SS Katzman, Waffen SS, K-A-T-Z-M-A-N, decided, we'll let those 34 live. Now, this number game is getting interesting because 149,000 out of one group are gone. Let's let the 34 live. So there's a lot of fire coming in now from the east. The Soviet Union is moving in. And according to Wiesenthal, the prisoners and the guards all left together. They didn't kill those 34. They left together with their 34, what shall we call them, buddies. And they went to a railroad station and they were pushed into cars and the SS men uh, were with them and treated animals kindly and the SS men traveled and they went to the city of Przemysl, P-R-Z-E-M-Y-S-L. I know I'm not pronouncing that right, probably. And July the 16th, 1944, Simon Wiesenthal is called to the see the officer in charge, a Mr. Waltke, W-A-L-T-K-E, Oscar Waltke, who had saved him at one point, spoke up and said, don't shoot him. And uh, this now he's been called to see Mr. Waltke. As I say, the Russians are getting closer, the planes and guns, you can hear them. And the prisoners are all told because of this, get into the courtyard. And they all stood in a row along a long table. And at the table, Mr. Walkie and an SS man by the name of Engels, Waffen SS, took a name and files, and they called out these names, and they called a prisoner to the table. And it was similar to the Mengele operation when you went in Auschwitz. The thumb to the right said the Russians and Ukrainians, Poles, uh, are sentenced to death, go to the right. And then a thumb to the left was for the Jews, an instant massacre. Wiesenthal's name was called, and somebody yelled, that's him. And Mr. Angles motioned his thumb to the right. We're going into a mass grave, and the other side was for a group of Jews. And Wiesenthal allegedly said, I want to be buried with the Jews. I don't want to be with the other people. And then, according to Wiesenthal, suddenly there was a sky in the sky, there was some kind of an explosion of fire in the air. It didn't touch the prison, and the files were scattered, and he ran across the courtyard and said, I want to be with the Jews. And a minute later, at that point, two SS men came and put Simon Wiesenthal on a truck, and they were taken back to the Janowski concentration camp. He seemed to have revolved in and out of there or been there quite a bit. And when they were uh, put into the camp, some of them were sold as prisoners, as non-Germans, and they were put into forced labor. There was an organization called TODT, the state-controlled company that built fortifications, and they told these people, Louise and Thal, and the groups that were saved, forget you were Jews, forget you were in a concentration camp. Anyone who says they were from a camp or Jewish would be shot. But if you don't say you were from a concentration camp and you don't say you were Jewish, you can stay here. So they began to get food and schnapps, which is a Yiddish word for whiskey, and cigarettes and rations uh, from the SS guards. And they were at Plazow, P-L-A-S-Z-O-W, near Krakow. And the SS, uh, who were given these 34 Jews to guard, kept them from their frontline duty. And there were 200 SS men now traveling or working with 34 Jews who said if they were not camp inmates and they weren't Jews, they could stay with 200 SS men. And Mr. Warzak, who was in charge of them, said they could reach the woods until the war was over, that they would be given protection. As the Russians came closer, they moved to Plazow, P-L-A-S-Z-O-W, concentration camp. And at Plazow, uh, they, two of Warzak's men from the Waffen-SS 
Mr. Diga, D-Y-G-A, the same man who had the firing squad a little while back, and Mr. Wirtz took most of the remaining 34 Jews to the woods. That's the fellow that set up a table and had the firing squad when Wiesenthal's name was called back a while back, and he survived that one. So now they're back in a camp, 34 Jews that traveled with 200 men of the Waffen-SS, and Diga and Wirtz decide that most of those Jews have to be shot. I don't know why I refer to them two men. They were both Waffen SS and hardly gentlemen. Now, they are moved from this particular camp where a hunk of them are killed, and Wiesenthal, he doesn't say how many out of those particular 34 survived with him. They go from Plasau to Breslau, another concentration camp, and uh, this time he is near, he's in Poland, but near. Uh, the Warsaw Ghetto, and he's getting close to it. And Wiesenthal, according to his account on page 39 and 40 of his book, unsuccessfully tried to get a message through to his wife. Now, do you believe, uh, think about this, that you're traveling with the Waffen SS, you've sur survived like three firing squads, you've survived uh, holding this diary with a list of people that are doing crimes, they found you in a house, you've escaped from a prison, your wife, in quotes, escaped, how could he, in the hands of the Waffen SS, in October of 44, jeopardize his wife if he knew where she was? And how would he know where she was? All these alleged millions are being put in the oven. And if he meets her after the war, and if they know the Russians are coming from the east, moving in against them, and that's why they're leaving with the Waffen SS, he and a chosen few, why would he attempt while in their custody to communicate with her? And what indication does he know that she's still around? Later, he says he thought she was dead. But why, you know, here he has the pistols that he's able to escape. She can escape. And all of these things happening. Uh, how is it possible that he would even attempt to give anyone a message? Or how could he leave the base to contact her? Or what made him think that she was near him? Now, Wiesenthal is then transferred to another location, and he's taken back to the concentration camp, where this time only a few Jews survived. This is sort of like musical chairs. We're down to a few. And the SS, according to his account, needed artisans, tailors, plumbers, shoemakers. And he said if he had his diary with a list of SS tortures with specific details, you know, he would be hurt or killed. And he had the diary with him, and he said the Gestapo then would have enough evidence to hang him ten times. These are his words. So on June the 15th, 1944, two men come from the Gestapo, come to the jail for him. One is uh, Oscar Walke, W-A-L-T-K-E, a high officer in the Fuhrer's Army in the Waffen-SS, and described as the most feared man in the WOW, L-W-O-W, a different pronunciation also. I, again, I know it's wrong, but we'll go back to the history of that town, and David's been checking that out also. And he describes Waltke uh, as cold, mechanical, sadistic, in charge of the Gestapo Jewish Affairs section, okay? And he made Jews with fake Polish papers admit that they were Jews if they were fake papers, and he would torture and kill them and, of course, have them shot, and I'm sure worse than shot. So now Simon Wiesenthal is in the hands of Oscar Waltke, and he, he refers to his torturing Gentiles until they said they were Jews and various activity. Now, Waltke's name was on Simon Wiesenthal's list of tortures and murders to be punished later. Waltke studied it, got the diary from Simon Wiesenthal of who the guards were and what their crimes were. This is the meanest man around uh, uh, on the western side, it was Otto Skorzeny. Now, Walke studies it with interest, according to Wiesenthal, and Wiesenthal was afraid of special treatment, of course, because if he wasn't shot, there'd be something else. He was led to a dark courtyard, and the truck from the Gestapo prison waited, and he took out a small razor and allegedly tried to commit suicide. And Walke, the mean Gestapo man, yelled, Get in quick, into the truck. He got on the truck, and he had lost consciousness, and he woke up in the cell of the Gestapo prison hospital. They didn't let him cut his wrist. Now, he traveled with two guns. He had a razor. I'm sure there was a lot of shaving going on in these concentration camps. Just picture the scene as the war was winding down, getting close to winding down. Now, 
according to his account, and I'd be embarrassed to admit it, he shared the cell with a member of the German Gestapo SS and another Ukrainian he calls a deserter. And the doctors told him that he was the only Jew ever treated in a Gestapo hospital, but an only Jew with a diary of the men who were doing the torturing that you'd want retribution later in their crimes. And what they did, they gave orders, special orders, to speed his recovery. So they doubled his soup and doubled his vegetables and sent him back to Janowski, near home base. And once again, a second time, the commander came in, Frederick Warzok, SS Frederick Warzok. I mentioned him before. He walked past the prisoners. He stood in front of Wiesenthal, greeted him, and said, How is one of my old guests? Now, this is beyond comprehension. And he wanted to know how Wiesenthal was and how he escaped. And Wiesenthal didn't want to turn in or implicate people who had helped him. Then Warzok, not punitive at all, became cordial, according to Wiesenthal. He told the others to shoot all the Jews in that camp. We're down to numero uno now, except Simon Wiesenthal. Uh, if you just heard this broadcast and didn't hear the one before, get the two-part tape or the three-part. This is part three on Simon Wiesenthal. Now, Warzak introduced Wiesenthal as the lost son who came back. At this point in history, he's friendly with the meanest man around or one of the two meanest of the camp. And the conversation, according to the account of Wiesenthal, was, you thought I would have you shot. And the conversation goes on here. People die when I want them to die. Go back to your barracks and don't do any work. Double the food rations for you. Warzak had been responsible for the death of at least 70,000 Jews. And there were more of 149,000 now were practically down to one or two. So he was given special medical care. They had concern about him. The Nazis were closing in. And then he jumps to a section in his book that I mentioned before, how he escapes after the special treatment and food with a relative of Prince Radziwill. To be there are a lot of Radziwills in Poland, but the Prince Radziwill was the pretender to the throne of Adolf Hitler, who had overthrown the Soviet Union and had been allowed to keep Poland. And the Radziwill was part of the IG Farben chemical network. Farben was running the extermination gases at Auschwitz and was running Auschwitz where the Pope worked during the war at the camp and a relative of the prince, the prince who became the brother-in-law of Jacqueline Bouvier o. Kennedy Onassis. This relative was with Simon Wiesenthal and I mentioned that a few weeks ago. Now, Wiesenthal was taken to what he calls death block number six at Malthusen concentration camp. This is to be his last camp. It's an Austrian camp. He's out of Poland. He had survived the special rations. He had survived the special treatment from his fresh special friends. And into Malthusian on May the 5th, 1945, the U.S. Army 65th Division comes and liberates the U.S. Army police come in there and liberate them. The war officially in that part of Europe was over May the 8th. He's down to skin and bones. He's not as well-fed as some, but he was given the rations to survive. He was given the means to survive. The man who knew he had the list of future people who could be rounded up or charged with crimes gave him double treatment, made him in a hospital to make sure he was safe, and prevented him, of course, from a suicide. He was put with Waffen SS in the cell and in a Gestapo hospital where he went on to be the great multi-million dollar ray fundraiser to remember the Holocaust. Now, in this camp, uh, he started being accompanied by an American captain who was a tra used him as a translator. And the U.S. Army police said he could be used as a translator. So he got started almost immediately within two to three weeks. It was just a two to three week time that he was working for the war crimes section of the U.S. Army. Now, again, keep in mind his training was in engineering and architecture. Then it was painting at the railroad yard, happy birthday, Fuhrer, and uh, similar things for the Fuhrer, you know, uh, we love Hitler. And then and, and being allowed sections here where we don't know where he lived or who he was with to escape camps, to have a rifle, to be special fed, to be taken to all these places, and then 
to start working for the war crimes section. How did they single out Simon Wiesenthal within two to three weeks? I have the dates, uh, two weeks of resting up and getting some food, but immediately he started working for the United States Army and then was assigned to the Nuremberg Tribunal. A captain went back to the United States and left Wiesenthal in charge of with the military policemen over there in this reconstruction period. Wiesenthal was left to arrest Nazis. Now, these pretty mean guys, you knock on the door, his account is you go see them, and his knees were weaker than the Nazi, and they come out. He has a long story. Oh, hello, I'm glad to see you. And the Nazis escorted without any problem. He is left to arrest Nazis. Now, after going through all these experiences, through 12 camps, etc., etc., how come Simon Wiesenthal was hired by the U.S. Army? so fast. So soon he was transferred to the United States Justice, equivalent justice, the OSS, which is the equivalent, the CIA took over from the OSS. It was formed by British intelligence and then did the U.S. Counterintelligence Corps, the CIC. I'll do more on Wiesenthal and what happens after 1945. He was working for the United States government at this particular time and uh, in Austria under the the interest of looking for Nazi war criminals while the very biggies under his nose got away. The only one pulled in was Adolf Eichmann and all the rest went on to affect our medical society, our psychological uh, well-being and the psychology departments of universities and hospitals, our banking systems, our railroad aircraft, NASA space, they went everywhere like a disease into every core of our piece of our country. The only, like I say, I'll go back or up to 1960 when Eichmann was brought in. Then he closed the tables and made a deal. And I'll talk to you about the deal. It had to do with San Paulo, Brazil, and France Stengel and Romeo Tuma in Brazil. He made a deal. He cut a deal. That is going to the horrendous part of the Mengele story now. Time is out. I'll be back next week with Simon Wiesenthal cutting a deal in Sao Paulo, Brazil.